good afternoon, uh, good evening. Welcome to our joint webinar with Neuron called Power Up Digital Transformation in Breweries, where we discuss how uh, MQTT's Pathplug specification plays a key role in bridging the gap between OT and IT systems. And uh, we will showcase it via a technical demo. It is a pleasure to have you all. I'm Jayshree Hegde, helping with uh, moderating this uh, webinar. Allow me to introduce you all to the speakers for today. Jose Granero, Head of uh, Customer Success and Sales Engineering at Neuron, and Kudzai Manditaritsa, who is the Developer Advocate at HiveMQ. A very warm welcome to you, Jose and uh, Kudzai. Thank you for taking time today to present this webinar. Before we kick off uh, the session, I would like to share that we are recording this webinar and we will share the recording as well as the presentation slide uh, over a follow-up email. During the presentation, if you have any questions, uh, please use the Q&A pod or the Q&A box, which you can find in the control panel uh, right below the Zoom uh, window. There will be a dedicated Q&A uh, session uh, after the presentation and the demo. Uh, our speakers will be answering all your questions. And uh, we will also be launching a quick poll. I request you all to cast uh, votes uh, during that time. So without further ado, I will uh, let Kudzai uh, take it over and I'll let Kudzai and Jose introduce themselves. Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you so much, Jeshri, for the introductions. Uh, welcome everybody to today's webinar. Uh, my name is Kudzai Mandi Teresa. I'm a developer advocate at Hive MQ, and uh, my role here involves uh, helping uh, solutions architects and developers um, to adopt MQTT and Sparkplug for uh, their digital transformation strategies. So I'll um, hand it over to Jose to introduce yourself. Kudzai. Uh, thank you and hello everybody. I'm super excited to be here today. I'm Jose Granero, the head of customer success and sales engineering at the Neuron Creativity Systems. Um, I have over 20 years of experience in industrial automation and system integration. And uh, in my current role, I work uh, with companies on accelerating their digital transformation journey by utilizing the Neuron platform to build um, robust, scalable and secure IoT architectures and solutions. Okay, thank you, Jose. So I think we'll get uh, right into it. So um, as uh, Jeffrey mentioned, we're going to have a, a demo at the end of this, um, uh, towards the, 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 the middle of this session, but I kind of want to start with the laying the, the, the foundation here by discussing uh, why we need to uh, kind of like uh, talk about MQTT, spark plug in the context of uh, digital transformation uh, for manufacturing. So uh, let's begin by looking at uh, some of the reasons why manufacturers uh, would want to uh, undergo digital transformation. So one of the big reasons uh, uh, that manufacturers uh, would want to undergo digital transformation is, is that they'd want to improve uh, their operational efficiency uh, to reduce production costs, increase productivity, and improve product quality. And, and the way to achieve that is by streamlining their processes reducing wastage, increasing the speed at which they produce goods, and also reducing uh, the number or the amount of resources that they use uh, for production. Another objective for digital transformation in manufacturing is that manufacturers want to enhance customer satisfaction in order to build brand loyalty, increase customer uh, retention, and increase sales. And also the way to achieve that is mainly through uh, providing personalized products and, and services to create a more positive uh, customer experience. And furthermore, manufacturers want to also be able to boost innovation and agility uh, by leveraging advanced technologies such as artificial intelligence and industrial internet of things, as this would help them to, uh, uh, to improve their ability to innovate and quickly adapt to, to the ever-changing uh, market needs, right? And lastly, this is really all about increasing competitiveness uh, in order to remain profitable and, and successful as a business. Now, the underlying fact here is that to achieve all of these uh, objectives that I've just out outlined in the last slide is that you need to uh, become a data-driven company. So how do you become a data-driven company? 
it's, this is primarily by laying down a data infrastructure that allows you to integrate data from all your manufacturing business units uh, in a contextual and meaningful way. However, the challenge is that traditional industrial systems are not designed to communicate easily with each other due to proprietary point-to-point -point interfaces. And this often results in a spaghetti architecture that you are currently looking at uh, on your screens. And this architecture is based on a request response model of communication. And uh, fundamentally, this makes it difficult to integrate old and new systems, which is typically of a digital transformation strategy where you want to bring in a mix of uh, smart uh, 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 things and also legacy uh, 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 devices and systems to bring them together to integrate that uh, data into uh, one common uh, uh, repository of information. And also this architecture, it makes it hard to scale your IoT solution, right? Because for each uh, point or device that you need to bring into this architecture, you need some custom engineering uh, to actually implement that. And also it's difficult to actually make better use of your data across your systems because data has to go across, uh, has to go mul across multiple hops uh, from your MES to your SCADA and, and also going all the way up to the cloud. So that kind of um, uh, separation of layers makes it difficult to actually get data that you can use to actually uh, model your business around because there is loss in data integrity uh, along the way as you can't really get the full scope of your data from data that has been aggregated uh, and propagated up the, the layers, right? And uh, there's uh, also many other reasons why uh, this industrial architecture uh, uh, makes it difficult to actually use it as the basis for your uh, digital transformation strategy. Now, what is the solution uh, in such a case? Uh, the best uh, approach for manufacturers uh, is to adopt a data infrastructure that enforces a decoupled communication architecture. So specifically, a data infrastructure that uses the publish subscribe mechanism of communication, because this would allow your devices uh, and systems to receive and send data without requiring that direct uh, line of communication between the systems, which sort of forces a, a tightly coupled architecture. So this uh, uh, decoupled architecture, this published subscribe mechanism of communication allows for a more flexible and scalable communication interface. So uh, I'm sure a lot of you on this call are familiar with the uh, MQTT, which is a protocol that uh, really implements this published subscribe uh, paradigm of communication. So MQTT really it's based on, 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 on components that include uh, clients, which are typically at the edge or your factory, and then a broker, which is located at a central location. So this could be at a cloud, or this could be uh, uh, locally deployed within your uh, own uh, 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 factory or within your own data center. And then these clients or nodes in that system would exchange information by publishing that information to the broker. The broker then coordinates how that information is distributed to the participants. And uh, the the participants, they indicate what inf information they are interested in by subscribing to a specific topic. So you would then go on to use that topic to sort of like create a structure that uh, uh, delineates your, your manufacturing businesses. So you can uh, 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 arrange your, uh, your, your, your MTT topics based on your, your, your manufacturing business units. And then you have your publishers pushing that information uh, to topics that are specific or relevant to uh, whoever is subscribed under that uh, information. So MQTT is a, a, a generic right form of communication. So that uh, uh, topic that MQTT uses is, uh, is flexible, right? So that's a, a, an advantage because obviously it allows you to kind of build any system, right? It kind of allows you to uh, structure your topic anyhow and, and incorporate it into uh, your system or whether it's a, a manufacturing or it's a commercial uh, uh, sector. But that when it comes to SCADA or industrial IoT uh, communication, that uh, uh, introduces a, a disadvantage right now because you want to be able to identify where information is coming from within your infrastructure. So you want to have a standardized topic namespace. So this is where uh, MQTT or the, 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 the foundation, uh, uh, Eclipse Foundation came 
about with the spark plug specification specification that then specifies the topic namespace which allows you to use a more uh, standardized approach when you when you are now using your topics which then allows your uh, systems your industrial systems to communicate easily with each other because using that standardized topic namespace you know exactly uh, where that information is coming from. So uh, there's a lot of information out there that is going to show you how exactly that uh, 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 topic is composed of, but generally it allows you to logically group uh, your devices based on how uh, the, 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 the setup is typically uh, uh, is in a, in, in a manufacturing uh, environment. So another thing that Sparkplug does is that uh, with MQTT, uh, your payload is, um, could be anything, right? So when you send a message using MQTT, it could be an alarm, it could be a, 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 a command, it could be an a, a, a anything really. So you never know until you read that message, you decode it, and then you actually interpret it. So now that's a disadvantage because you want to know what sort of message uh, to expect. So Sparkplug, what it does is that it, it specifies your payload representation so that when you know that a system expects an integer with so, so much properties, then that's what you're going to get. Uh, it, it expects a float, it expects a different data type, it expects a, a template. So it allows you to model your data, which makes it easy to actually interoperate between systems because you know what sort of what, what type of data to expect. So that's another uh, layer that uh, Sparkplug adds to your queue of vanilla MQTT. And then uh, another thing that uh, Sparkplug adds to that um, MQTT is the state management. So in a, in, a, in a SCADA network, it's critical to, to know what this current state of your participant is, right? So you want to know if the pump is currently connected, right, Be before you send a command to it. So M the Sparkplug allows you to then uh, define the state management with things like your birth certificate. So, so when a new uh, node joins that system, it sends a birth message so that you know this is uh, the node that is going to be connected and these are the properties that this node has and these are the values that I expect from this node. So you know at any point what is the connection status uh, of that um, uh, of that participant of your network, which is really critical uh, in scatter networks to to have. So this what you're looking at right now is, a, is an architecture of a typical Sparkplug uh, implementation in an industrial IoT setup. So your Sparkplug um, network would con consist of what were called uh, edge of network nodes. So these are typically uh, gateways uh, or devices that provide an interface uh, between like your legacy uh, uh, protocols. So they could be communicating things like OPC UA and Modbus uh, to downstream devices. And then on the other end, they will be communicating that information using a Sparkplug specification over an MQTT network. And you also have things like your application nodes, which are your MES, historian analytics, and, uh, and, 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 and applications that also participate in that Sparkplug network. And then you also have your SCADA as your host because you still need to have that component that is responsible for, for like controlling the participation within your, 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 your MQTT network. So a SCADA will, will, will be your host in this instance, it would be irresponsible for sending the commands and, and, and so forth. So that is this typical uh, uh, Sparkplug architecture that you'd uh, uh, get when you uh, put together uh, your Sparkplug network. So now what we're going to do is we're going to go into a demo where uh, Jose is going to actually uh, assimilate like a, a brewery uh, environment and start publishing these Sparkplug messages to kind of show you how this could be used in a real world environment. But for him to be able to do that, I need to set up a broker, which uh, I've already done, but I'm going to walk you through how easy it is to set up a, a, a broker on the IFMQ platform. So IFMQ actually offers different flavors of brokers. So you could use a, a hosted a broker, self-hosted broker, where you could actually deploy it in your own cloud environment. But the one that we're using today is our managed service, which is IFMQ Cloud. Right, so you could see, sign it, uh, sign up for it by going to the HiveMQ website. When you go to the HiveMQ website, you just click on cloud. It will take you to this page and then you click on uh, sign up free. Uh, so this free account allows you to actually connect up to 100 devices. So it doesn't require you to uh, enter any credit card details or anything like that. So with just a, a click, you have your uh, cluster already configured for you. So when you're doing it for the first time, 
you need to set up your, uh, your access credentials and uh, so that you can uh, connect your MQTT clients. So this is the cluster that we are using for this demo right now, the MQTT broker cluster. But if you need to kind of like create a new cluster for yourself, uh, all you need to do is just to click on this button where it says create new cluster, right? And then you can just uh, select the, the, the cluster that you want. Create cluster, and then you select the cloud provider. So I'll just select Azure. And then just like that, you've created your, uh, your MQTT broker cluster, and then you can then copy your URL address and then start uh, publishing messages to it. So now I'm going to hand it over to uh, Jose to uh, kind of uh, show us what he's got. Thank you, Gute. Okay, um, well, first of all, let's uh, take a quick look at um, the main benefits that data transformation can bring to, to breweries. Uh, like many other industries that have chosen to undergo the digital transformation, breweries are seeking to modernize and simplify their operations at the same time. And the main goal is the same as for any other industries, uh, that is uh, to have better insights into their production processes to make better decisions that result in being more competitive and flexible. Some of the, of the benefits uh, they can obtain by uh, starting this digital transformation is um, increased efficiency and performance in the, the industrial floor um, by minimizing downtimes and unnecessary costs, as well as identifying bottlenecks. Quality control improvements uh, resulting in savings on returns from poor quality products and reducing uh, waste of materials for bad batches. Now brewmasters can have unprecedented visibility into the brewing process, so they can predict and monitor the complex chemical and biological uh, fermentation parameters uh, to produce the highest quality product. This is also a strongly regulated industry, so industrial tra and digital transformation can also help um, in, in this regard um, by achieving the reduction of uh, non-conformities associated with bad or missing data. For example, tracking batches more efficiently and automating reporting. Um, digital transformation can also help um, reduce energy use and therefore the, car the carbon footprint uh, and the associated uh, production cost, of course, thus uh, making the, the process uh, more sustainable. And finally, uh, it can also enable product innovations. There are some priority groups who have already started using machine learning algorithms to adapt their recipes to um, consumers' expectations. Let's, uh, let's go to the next slide, please, Kute. Okay, that's uh, so far with the, we've seen the benefits, but what about the challenges? Well, actually these are very different from those that any other industries are encountering when uh, starting their, their digital transformation process. Um, here we have the huge number and variety of data sources that could say um, mentioned a few minutes ago. Uh, in a typical factory, we can have hundreds of data sources distributed across machine controls, PLCs, SCADAs, historians, just to name a few. And um, these um, can be uh, legacy systems and um, many of them uh, through, data, through data silos. Um, then we have integrating data from multiple systems across multiple plants, which can be especially difficult, difficult when having um, many separate control networks and uh, or even uh, a lack of IT infrastructure. And like any other project, uh, the, a detailed transformation project, project requires investment and resources. Uh, and here, for example, we can mention licensing, licensing costs, which uh, can easily uh, skyrocket depending on the solution you choose. Uh, another major concern nowadays is the fear of exposing operational systems to cyber threats. And finally, we have the lack of uh, technology knowledge in-house. Okay? So uh, the root cause of all these problems is the difficulty of integrating data uh, streams um, across applications in a, in a multi-vendor and, and uh, multi-system ecosystem. And here is uh, where Neuron comes in, since it provides uh, the right tools for overcoming all of, uh, all of these uh, obstacles. Neuron is a complete IoT uh, communication and edge computing uh, platform um, that bridges the gap in between the, the plant floor and third party applications running either on premise or in the cloud. With Neuron, it's uh, extremely easy to create bi directional data pipelines between OT and IT. 
uh, decouple devices from applications by aggregating, structuring, and producing all your operational data in a, in a single source of truth and making all this data available across the entire company. It's uh, fully modular. Uh, we have three, three different sets of modules, data acquisition, data delivery, edge computing, and visualization. In, in the data acquisition family, we have OPC UA client, Modbus clients, Siemens, et cetera. Whereas in, in data delivery, we can find a REST API server, OPC UA server, a Spark plug. And finally, in edge computer and visualization, we have um, our historia module, for example, which uses MongoDB, and uh, also other modules for uh, running your own code uh, at the edge, such as uh, derived tags and scripting. Uh, as I, um, you can stack the modules, um, we have over 40 modules uh, right now, and there are more coming soon, which you can stack uh, according to your needs. Of course, uh, you only need to acquire those uh, modules as to be necessary for your application. It's also cross-platform, uh, meaning it can run on most versions on Windows and Linux distributions, as well as on uh, ARM architectures, for example, Raspberry Pi. We have an unlimited uh, licensing model. Uh, Neuron is unlimited in tags, unlimited in users, unlimited in connections and devices. Um, it's a fully web-based. Once you start, all you need to access the node is a web browser. Uh, you can install it in less than a minute. And um, the development environment allows you to create your data model very quickly. Um, a single node can manage uh, several hundred thousand tags. And uh, Neuron is extremely efficient also in terms of hardware requirements. Uh, finally, you can um, deploy distributed architectures uh, connecting uh, uh, several nodes uh, to each other and, um, and, and deploy the architectures according to your needs. So, uh, yes, please. Uh, thank you, say. In a nutshell, Neuron is a Swiss uh, army knife that has everything you need to address any IoT project, no matter what the, your requirements are. So, let's get into the demo. For today's demo, we're going to use uh, an example based on a real case. Here in, here in Spain, the largest brewery group uh, is using Neuron to collect structure and standardize all its processes data in all of its plants. And this is the typical architecture uh, they have in each of them. Neuron is exchanging data with a variety of systems and devices, which we can see on the left-hand side of the, of the image. Uh, for example, SQL databases, labeling, labeling machines, PLCs, uh, which are controlling some processes which are not integrated within, within the distributed control system. They're also monitoring power, uh, power, consum uh, power consumption. That's why they're collecting data from the gas meter and power meters. And we are going to see how easily we can create um, a data model and start uh, pushing all this data to um, uh, HiveNQ's uh, cluster of brokers to make this data available to, um, to a Spark plug enable application, for example, a Canary, okay? Uh, well, um, we're going to focus on the last, uh, the last stage of, uh, brewing, uh, of the brewing uh, manufacturing process, uh, which is bottling. This is the um, uh, filling line. Okay, on the left-hand side, we can see, by the way, this is a real screenshot of uh, the SCADA application of one of the plants, courtesy of our integrator, Trecor Control Works, who is uh, the, the system integrator who has uh, carried out the, the project. And here we can see on the left-hand side the uh, prefilling tank where the several parameters are being monitored, pressure, alcohol content, uh, density, et cetera, and the same along the filling lines. And at the end of the lines, we have the, um, the filling tabs. Uh, this one could say, please. Uh, we have the, the filling tabs um, and where um, the, the system is collecting uh, information from this uh, from the inspectors at, at these uh, filling, uh, filling tabs. Uh, regarding um, the total number of borders processed, the total numbers uh, of um, uh, borders rejected. The rejection causes can be borders overfilled, underfilled, uh, without uh, a tap, without a cap, sorry, and, uh, or with fragments, okay? So now I'm going to show you very quickly, I'm going to share my screen. Okay, and uh, I'm going to show you how you can download uh, install Neuron very quickly. All you have to do is to come to our website, okay? And at the top of, uh, on, on every page, you have this uh, big download Neuron button. Click on it and it will take you to the download page. Here you can download um, 
the starter for whatever operating system. It's a full, uh, fully functional uh, trial version from Body for two hours. You can restart it uh, any number of times. And um, so you can get a proof of concept uh, without having to buy any licenses. I'm not going to install it on, on my local computer because uh, I do already have it installed. Okay, and once it's installed, uh, it automatically opens up in your, in your web browser. I'm going to access my local instance here. And well, this is the web user interface with, uh, where everything is configured within Neuron. As you can see, it's um, very clean and intuitive. And the first thing I'm going to do is to create a, a new module, in this case, an OPC UA client module, since I have to connect to an OPC UA server. For that, I'm going to come here to modules. I'm going to click on this button on the model header, and I'm going to give it a consistent name, OPC UA client. I need to select the, the module type, the functionality uh, from this drop-down menu, which offers me uh, all the modules currently implemented within the, the, plan, the platform. Okay, so if I go down here, I'm going to say it OPC UA client. I need to also to save the logger and API configuration sections. Okay, once I have created the module, I can start creating my, the connections. I'm going to create my first connection to that OPC UA server, which is providing the data for the inspectors. I'm going to type in here the URL, which in this case is 10.101.4.23 on the port 3005. And uh, I'm going to save it, okay. And here I'm going to select the endpoint. Okay. Here it is. I'm going to save the changes. And now I need to trust the certificate that the server is going to, to send. Here it is. I need to do the same on the server side, so I'm going to do it here. And once I've uh, done it, okay, if I come here to the OPC browser, I can start browsing the, the server and check uh, all the, the tags uh, available there, okay? Once I'm connected, I can start creating my, my data model. For that, I'm going to come here to the, to the tax configuration section, and I'm going to create here, here a new group. I'm going to name it a plant. I'm going to add another one here, name line one, for example. And inside line on one, line on one, I'm going to have another group, which I'm going to name inspector O1, okay? Uh, now I'm going to create my, name, my first tag, borders overfill, for example, for this inspector. In Neuron, everything is configured at the tag level. So here we can define the type, um, the type of, the, of the tag, the format, the decimal precision, et cetera, the dead band, which is going to determine, which is going to determine when an, a new event is going to be generated, if this tag ha, has right permissions or not, uh, the, persistence, the persistence mode, if I need, um, need it to be persistent, it can be persistent in memory and, uh, or in disk. Some details, for example, a description or and the engineering units in, in case uh, they apply it. Um, I can also scale the raw values and um, receiving from the from the server. And this is the most important section. Okay, here I need to specify the data source when I'm I'm going this in this stack is going to come from. I'm going to enable it. I'm going to select again the functionality or the, the, um, the functionality of the module I'm going to use to, go to, to assign the, the values to, the, to this tag. And here I need to enter, to enter the instance I created previously, as well as the, the connection, which was inspectors, okay? By the way, uh, Neuron provides a very useful uh, contextual help uh, down here, which uh, has a very useful tips for almost every field. 
Now I'm going to browse the, the browser again to select my tag. Okay, I can also, uh, if I had a, an, a, an instance of uh, our historian module, I could uh, uh, log the, the historian, historical values of this uh, tag in that uh, local historian or remote historian or both. Okay, I can also create and assign as many alarms uh, as I need to this tag. Okay, let's keep it for the moment. And if I come to real time, I'm going to see. Uh, my uh, my tag displaying with a uh, good quality here. Now I can, for example, duplicate this tag and uh, rename it. I'm going to manually change the node ID down here. Okay, and uh, here it is. Okay, and. I could keep on working the same way. I could copy and paste uh, the tags and start creating and keep on creating my my um, inspector tags here and then copy the inspector, etc. But since we have uh, 10 inspectors per line and three lines, it makes sense uh, to use templates. That's why I'm going to drag and drop this inspector to the templates panel. I'm going to rename it. Uh, templates uh, using inheritance. So any changes I make to a template are going to be automatically uh, inherited by all the instances of that template. Okay. I can also nest uh, a template within uh, another and um, the value of the custom property of a template can be uh, inherited from an upper entity in the, in the hierarchy as, well as we're going to see right now. I'm going to create a couple of custom properties for this inspector template line. Inspector. Okay, I'm going to say that the line value is going to be an inherited value from another custom property. Okay, which I'm going to name line two. Sorry, capital letter. Okay, and down here in the in the note ID configuration, the note ID field. Sorry, I'm going to build expression uh, using a um, my custom properties. So I'm going to add an equal at the beginning, quotes, since it's a string. Here I'm going to replace the one for my uh, custom property between curly brackets. In this case is line. And this vector custom property. Okay, and I'm going to do the same for uh, World Center field. Okay, I'm going to save it. And now I'm going to create another, um, another instance, another template, sorry. Um, I'm going to name it line and it's going to have only one custom property, which I'm going to name line two. And uh, down here, I'm going to start creating instances of my inspector, given that each line has uh, up to 10 inspectors. Okay, so I'm going to create inspector one. The, the value of the of the line is going to be inherited and the inspector or one is going to have a value equal to one. I'm going to duplicate. Okay, so now I'm going to delete all what I've created previously here. Okay, I'm going to save the changes. And now I'm going to create a new instance of uh, my line template, which I'm going to name lane01. I'm going to say this is one. Okay, the same for example for line two. Okay, 
by the way, I can, if I needed to create a lot of uh, instances, for example, I can export everything to a CSV file, work on the CSV file, and import it back to Neuron. I'm going to save the changes. And if I come here to real time, I can see my values displayed uh, with uh, good quality. Okay, so once I've uh, finished created my, my data model, and now I'm going to share this data through Sparkplug. For that, I'm going to create another, another module. Sparkplug mo Spark plug module, okay. I'm going to select again the data type in the drop down from the drop down menu. Okay. And uh, here I'm going to uh, create a group edge uh, of node and device following the, the topic definition of the Sparkplug specification. So, for example, I'm going to name it group one, H01. Here I can, uh, um, if I, uh, I can create uh, one or several uh, connections to, to one or several brokers if I want to provide uh, any type of uh, redundancy to the to the architecture okay so for example I can enter my flat my first uh, broker I need to define the protocol MQTT or MQTTS the broker uh, URL okay you know whatever Uh, I can enter a client ID or it will be automatically generated by the application. I can also uh, enter my credentials if needed, as well as the, the certificates in case I use encryption and the primary host and um, configure also the store and forward section. And finally, I'm going to add a new device and a filter to, pop, to publish the, the whole model, okay? And that's it, okay? So I'm going to jump to, uh, to another module I have here, to another neural node, sorry. I have here with uh, the whole module already configured. Okay, here I have uh, 293 tags. And if I come to config tags, I have several templates. I've used to create my, my model, okay? And I'm publishing all this, all this data through the Sparkplug uh, client module to, uh, I could say, is a hyphen Q cluster of brokers. This is the, the broker URL he's using. And um, I'm going to check that everything is working properly. For that, I'm going to come to diagnostics, real-time logs. I'm going to select here my Sparkplug client module going to change this to, to test mode and enable it. And uh, here you can see how um, Neuron is uh, publishing absolutely everything to that, uh, to that broker. I can also use, for example, NQT FX to, to check uh, that everything is, uh, is working properly, okay? And that's it. So I hand it back to you, I could say. Thank you, Jose, thank you. So... Okay, so now that uh, Jose is 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 now uh, publishing uh, all of these plug plug metrics to uh, to the high MQ broker, now I need to have a way of uh, then uh, uh, getting that data and visualizing it, right? To to then uh, uh, provide this uh, to to like your process engineers or whoever is responsible uh, with the decision making in your in your process. So for that, what we're using is a, a Spark plug application canary, which is a historian. So I'm going to take you through how that is configured to uh, receive that information. So this is basically the Canary administrator is uh, installed on my uh, PC here, right? So how you uh, normally go about it is to then come to where it says MQTT collector. So that's the module that allows you to collect, to connect to the Hive MQ broker, and then start receiving all those Sparkplug messages that uh, Jose is publishing from Neuron. So if you go into your, um, if you go into the MQTT collector here, you can see where I've configured the broker details, right? And use them the client, and then you can note that by using the SSL uh, uh, security here. So, and then if you go under subscriptions here, 
So I'm using a, a pound sign here to make sure to, 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 to indicate that I'm subscribing to everything that is being published to uh, my Hive MQ MQTT broker. So now if I go back to the home page, right? Um, so one thing to notice here before we go back, you see here it says we're actually receiving 293 texts, which is what um, Jose is publishing. So now I need to go into the historian, which is the actual database to see all of this information coming through. So as you can see here, uh, we've got this data that is coming through. Um, if I go into this, you can see this is the data from today. If I go in here, so this is these are all metrics that are being published uh, from uh, Neuron. So as you can see, we've, all, we've got all these metrics. So what we've done is I've gone ahead and uh, uh, taken the an overfilled. So we've got one metric here which says um, uh, Berkeley's overfilled uh, in the last hour. How many bottles have been overfilled uh, per line in the last hour? So we've got one here for line one, and then we've got another one for uh, line two, right? So we've got another uh, total bottles overfilled uh, in the last hour for line one and line two. So these uh, are the metrics that we're using to kind of demonstrate how we can then go on to uh, visualize this information. So now to do the actual visualization, we use a module, a canary module called uh, Axiom. So I'll show you how that uh, is set up. Okay, so this is the Axiom platform. So as you can see here, I've got a bar, a bar chart which shows uh, the total number of uh, overfilled bottles per, per line. So you see here, currently we're in this uh, hour period, we can see how many bottles were overfilled for line one. Uh, line two, line three. So obviously, uh, if you are a decision maker or a process engineer looking at this information, you are then empowered to make a decision to actually compare which line is performing better than the other. And then you can then maybe investigate what the cause of the problem could be if there is a machine uh, that is actually uh, causing a problem if that line is not performing well. So what we've actually done here is also put together some metrics for uh, pre-filling tanks. So we've got tank one and tank two. So in tank one, uh, we've got blonde L, and then in tank two, we've got a Pilsner. So we want to analyze what is the carbon, di uh, carbon dioxide content in each of those tanks. And then we can actually put it side by side. And then you can actually see here uh, the differences. You can see currently here, uh, we're reading 5.92 uh, for carbon dioxide content in, 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 in tank two and 5.92. Uh, six, seven in, in carbon dioxide content of tank one. So obviously this data might be uh, meaningless to me, but for someone who actually works in a brewery or an in process engineer, they know exactly what that means. Is it good? Is it bad? So this is the kind of visualization that you can actually get from all these spark plug metrics. So obviously you can imagine the kind of visualizations that you can build from this. So here, I just took these two examples to show you the kind of possibilities that you can get uh, from this. So now uh, to close this demo session, so this is specifically a, a, a brewery demo, but this can literally be applied to any industry, right? So if you're in pharma, you could apply this architecture. If you're in transportation, automotive, or all these other different sectors, you can apply this architecture to actually gain some in insight and then help you actually lay a foundation for a digital transformation uh, for your uh, enterprise. So uh, that uh, brings us to the end uh, of this demo. I'll uh, pass it over to you, Jayashree. Thank you, Kutzai. Thanks, Jose. Uh, what a fantastic presentation and a demo. I'm sure everyone would have uh, consumed this useful content. Um, there are a couple of questions coming in for you, uh, Jose and Kutzai, both of you. Uh, before kicking off uh, the Q&A session, I would like to launch the po uh, polls. I will uh, keep it open till the end of session. I request all the attendees to cast your votes. It will uh, give us a good feedback. Uh, let me launch the polls and uh, kick off the Q&A session. Okay, the polls are up. Uh, I request you all to participate. Moving on to Q&A. Um, 
So David is asking, can you explain canary? I don't know that this session wouldn't be enough to explain canary, but uh, maybe Kutsai or Ozi, maybe you can explain it in a line or two and uh, tell what it is. Then maybe we can move on to the next question. Oh yeah, absolutely. I'll, I'll, I'll give a short explanation and then maybe Jose, if you put something that you can jump in there. So uh, I don't know how much experience you've got with uh, with historians, but basically Canary is a historian, right? So you you typically, you if you're working in an industrial setup, you would want to, 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 to store all, all this information in a time series uh, kind of manner in such a way that it allows you to go back. So maybe at the end of the shift or maybe at the end of... Uh, uh, of the day, you want to go back and see what happened precisely at that moment. And then you want to correlate maybe the temperature with the pressure to see if that was the cause of whatever it is that you're trying to investigate. So Canary provides you that platform to store. So it, 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 it's a, it's an efficient storage mechanism that allows you to store all of this information, to historize it and allow you to go back and then kind of investigate and analyze the trends. And you can also use it for real-time analytics as well. So I don't know if that makes uh, makes it a bit clearer. Or if you have anything to add, Jose. No, no. As you know, I know Tanasberg with Canary. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Kudzai. Uh, the next question is for Jose. Uh, Oliver is asking, is there also a way to use models for different device types? and create the data model using those device models programmatically. Yes, of course, you can, uh, you can uh, create um, models. Uh, I, I, I think he's referring to templates, no? You can, you can do uh, uh, everywhere in, in Neuron, right? if you're using Modbus client, but you can do the same we've seen for a Spark Plug for OPC UA with, uh, with Modbus, for example, or for any other, any other modules. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Jose. Jose, our next question is for you again. Mohammed uh, mm -hmm. is thanking for the live demo and he has a question. He's asking, when I try to connect as OPC mm -hmm. client to Siemens WinCC, I mm -hmm. found huge number of tags, more than 80,000 tags. Mm -hmm. How could uh, this number of tags can be managed automatically? How, how can I manage that? <clears throat> If uh, by automatically he means how can uh, magically appear all, all this tag appear within neuron is not possible. You have to configure everything. But uh, again, uh, by leveraging templates and um, exporting the configuration to a CSV file and importing it back to neuron, it's only um, a matter of uh, hours to have all your model available. Cool. Thank you. There is a very interesting question from Praveen. Can you use Influx as time series historian? That's one for you. <laughs> yes. Uh... Okay. Yeah. So, so you can use uh, Influx, right, as a time series historian. So basically, what it boils down to is um, Influx is a is a is a generic time series uh, historian, right? But it like it. it you then have to build that layer of tools that allows you to then dig into that data because it was not specifically built for like uh, industrial applications. So you can certainly use Canary maybe in combination with things, uh, sorry, uh, Influx, maybe in combination with things like your Grafana, but like you have to kind of like build that stack yourself, right? So the difference between Influx and Canary is that Canary is, a, is built specifically for industrial data analysis. So it's got the tools that are specific to industrial analytics, but you can certainly use Influx as an as a historian. Hmm. Thanks, Kutzai. Uh, there is one question on chat in the brewery example. Are you including an AI platform to predict outcomes and raise alarms? Yeah. So, so we're, we're inside of Canary platform. So obviously there isn't. Um, uh, the, the AI capabilities as yet, um, but I, there are some platforms that allow you to actually ingest Spark plot metrics and then uh, perform some artificial intelligence analytics. I uh, can follow up uh, with you on that to give you the specific uh, application, AI uh, 
application that allows you to actually ingest uh, uh, spark plug data and do some predictions and all the different kind of things that you could do with uh, with that uh, within machine learning but it's certainly possible thanks Kutzai. um there is uh one more question from uh patrice uh it's in the q and a box if you are not using a service like neuron where does the topic definitions come from could you show a raw MQTT topic and payload as sent through Spark plug? Uh, maybe, uh, can, can you repeat the question? I think it's not sure. very clear to me. Sure, if you're not using a service like Neuron, where does the topic definitions come from? Could you show a raw MQTT topic and payload as sent through Spark plug? So well, if you're not using, uh, neuron and you're actually using a raw MQTT, uh, if I understand you correctly, that topic, you actually have to define it yourself, right? It's application specific. So on that MQTT client, that application that is publishing to the broker, this is where you define that topic uh, over the air, right? And then whatever application is subscribing to that needs to know that uh, uh, topic structure beforehand. So basically that's kind of like the, um, the reason why Sparkplug exists, right? So with Sparkplug, you already anticipate what topic structure, right? So you simply just uh, subscribe to whatever is coming and then you can then uh, process those topics because you know exactly how that structure is laid out. But with the raw MQTT, both applications that are participating in that MQTT network need to know what topic is being published to and then they can know what topic to uh, subscribe to. And then as, as for the payload itself, it can, come as a JSON, it can be a simple string, right? Or it can be a JSON payload. So again, you have got to build in that into your application to be able to interpret whatever JSON payload is being published. So again, this is also something that Sparkplug, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an advantage if you are dealing in an ecosystem where you don't really need to know, have some standardized, maybe if you're in home automation or any other kind of system where you don't really rely or, or on some standardized mechanism, but it becomes a disadvantage when you're dealing in industrial systems where you need to know what sort of payload to expect or what sort of topic namespace to expect. So I don't know if it answers your question. Thanks, Kutsai. Uh, the next question is for Oze. Um, so does the spark plug connector include store and forward? Probably they are referring to the neuron uh, platform. You're on mute, Oze. Right. Yeah, sure. Uh, sure, it does. Uh, when you configure the connection to the to the cluster of brokers, there's a section where you can also carry out all the configuration uh, as for the the start and forward mechanism. By default, I think it stores data for sixty days in case of communication outage, but it's fully configurable. Cool. Thank you. Uh, the next question is also for you, Jose. Uh, does Neuron have any limitations regarding the number of packs that can be published via Spark plug? No, it doesn't. Uh, as I said before, uh, Neuron is unlimited in tags, uh, regardless of the module you are using. Cool. Thank you so much. Uh, there is one question on Q&A &A box. In this demo, is Neuron a unified namespace? You can use Neuron to to define a unit to to define a unified namespaces, but especially using uh, Spark plug templates. Thanks, Jose. Maybe mm -hmm. just to quickly emphasize there on that uh, uh, question. So, it, Neuron in this case is being used to kind of describe the the the, the hierarchy, right? The, it uses the the Spark plug to describe the hierarchy uh, that structure of the unified namespace. And then it pushes to the broker. So in the broker, this is where the unified namespace lives, but it is being defined within a, a, a neuron platform, but it lives in the broker. So that's 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 the relationship between the broker and neuron there. Thanks, Kudzai. Thanks, Jose. <clears throat> uh, the next question is for you, Jose. Does the software work only when there is no connection, when there is a connection to the broker? Uh, when there is no connection to the broker, or it also works when the primary application is not consuming data. 
No, it does, and you can. Uh, it depends on how you configure it. Okay, but um, if you enable um, the possibility of using strong, you can enable the possibility of using also strong forward when the primary application is not consuming data. Cool. Thank you. There is one more question. Uh, so uh, there are a couple of questions. Uh, we still have like five minutes time. Uh, does the spark plug connector support more than one broker for redundancy? Yes, sure. As many as you want. <laughs> as many brokers as, uh, as you want or you need, depending on the, the redundant architecture you want to, to implement. You, have a, you can have a multiple redundant entity brokers. And if any broker is uh, unavailable, uh, the client is going to automatically step through a list until until it can connect to, to an available broker. The module also allows uh, different data to be published to um, as many brokers as need. Cool. Thanks, Jose. Probably You're the welcome. next question is for you again. What are the minimum hardware requirements to run Neuron? Well, as I said before, it's um, Neuron is extremely efficient in terms of hardware requirements. Minimum requirements are um, uh, a processor with uh, only one core and um, one gigahertz, uh, one gigabyte of RAM and one gigabyte of hard disk space. That's all. Um, of course, it depends on the scope of the project you or you are going to use neuron and how to properly size the, the hardware. But those are the minimum requirements. Cool. I think we have covered uh, almost all the questions that we got. Um, so I think we can uh, call it a day. Uh, thanks again, Kudzai and Oze. Uh, thank you for a fantastic uh, presentation and a fantastic demo. Uh, I enjoyed it a lot. I'm sure uh, the attendees have enjoyed it too. Uh, so like we shared, like I shared in the beginning of the session, we will uh, send a follow-up email, which will have uh, this, this webinar's recording. We will also share the slide presentation. You can have a look at it. If you have any follow-up questions for us, uh, please do email us or get in touch with us. The slide presentation has the contact details of Kudzai and Oze. And we also have a community forum where you can submit your uh, questions and ask questions. Um, other than that, we have a Spark Plug Essentials ebook, which is available on our website. If you are really new to Spark Plug, go ahead, uh, check out our resource page and you will find the ebook there. And if you want to uh, know about the new Spark Plug specification, we have a couple of resources about that too. Please do check, check them out. And uh, finally, there is uh, you can also download HiveMQ and Neuron uh, from the respective uh, websites. Uh, we request you all to evaluate it, try it out. Now, I think uh, I'll call it a day. Thanks again for tuning in. Uh, thanks again, Kudzai and Jose. Uh, see you all Thank next you time. So. Have a great Thank day. You. Thank Take you so care. much. Thank you so much, Thank everyone. You. Thank you, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.